Hi, and welcome to this uh, robotics version of RTKFNet's um, podcast. Today, I have Frederick Rom with me from AgroIntelli. Um, AgroIntelli is a ag tech company based in Denmark, and um, they build the Roboti, appropriately named. Uh, but I'll let Frederick uh, introduce himself and um, explain a little bit about AgroIntelli and who they are and what they do. So. Frederick, over to you. Thank you, and thanks for the invite to, to your podcast. So I'm Frederick, and I'm sales manager at Agrointelli. Um, so personally, personally, I was uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm Danish, and I was born and raised on a farm, uh, a large pig farm in in Denmark. And then I grew up, um, yeah, on this farm, and it has always been <laughs> in the blood of of, uh, of me and my family. Um, but despite that, I chose to, uh, educational-wise, um, study business development and innovation. And then in 2019, I ended up with um, AgroIntelli, um, where I'm a sales manager today. Um, and I've yeah, been here for yeah, close to two years now, first as product manager and now as, as sales manager. Um, a few words on AgroIntelli today. Um, we are Danish based. We are part of Agri Food Park, which is like a food tech cluster in, in Denmark. Um, allows us to, to knowledge share with um, many different alike companies to ourselves, but also major ones. So it's a good place for us to be and to develop. Um, and then we have our production facilities also in Denmark, but on the Western coast, actually just next to where they uh, make the big uh, Vistas windmills. Um, oh, okay, right. I, I, well, I know what you mean. I'm not sure anybody else will, but I, I do. Um, and so AgroIntelli, as you say, is an ag tech company um, and you do software and, and other things for the agricultural sector. What um, was the driving force behind deciding to go into robotics for AgroIntelli? Yeah, so um, I think this story begins around year 2000. Uh, where we first saw the uh, the early versions of uh, of robotics taking place, but on a in in different research projects. Um, then in 2010, uh, it was adopted by Kongskille here in Denmark, which is an implement manufacturer who later got um, bought by um, the uh, Echo Group, I think. Then in 2015, Agrointelli was founded. Um, and that it was powered by like key personnel from, from Kongskille. And among other projects, they took with them uh, ro the, robo uh, the Roboti project. Um, and it's correct, as you said, the first years from 2015 to 2018, we, work we were working with a lot of different technologies um, in AgTech. Uh, not only in robotics, but also yeah, different kind of software and, and in-field route planning, uh, weed um, detection, camera technology, and such things. And then around 2019, um, we decided to, to prioritize the robotics project. And today we actually more or less see ourselves as a manufacturing company um, and I guess the major drivers for this were the feedback we received uh, in the market. Uh, we are experiencing a huge interest in autonomous solutions for, for agriculture. Um, and that is, that is definitely uh, some of the, one of the key drivers for, for this uh, focus switch um, we did. But we are still involved in, uh, in, in uh, new technology on the vision side, but uh, we do perceive us as a manufacturing company of Robachi today. Okay, okay. So you guys, uh, you're, you're, the, you're, the new, you're the new CNH and Agco. Is that, so that's what's going to happen, is it? <laughs> Maybe. That would not be too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think everybody... Um, who sees this uh, and is in, involved in farming farmers will see so much in magazines and on social media about robotics and farming and robots. And, and there is a robot 
startup to do anything in, in agriculture now, whether it's weeding, picking strawberries, picking fruit, huge robots that are, are effectively self-propelled wheat drilling machines. I'm thinking of um, um, the DOT in, in North America and, um, and then uh, Agco themselves who have, have come out with the swarm robotics theory. And then we have um, CNH who have come up with their beautiful looking tractor that probably doesn't really have any real world stuff. John Deere that came up with their sort of Terminator looking, um, uh, you know, track system, all electric, which they showed off at, at um, Agritechnica a couple of years ago. And I mean, obviously I, uh, I know Far more about Roboti than I know about a lot of those products because we uh, at RTKFnet had Roboti on our stand at Lama in, in 2020. Um, and I've always very much liked the product because I, I feel, personally, I feel it differentiates itself from those other products. So can you give us some information or tell us what are your thoughts or, or how do you perceive that Roboti is different to uh, um, everything else on the market and, and what's its sort of it, its unique selling point against these other robots that people will see coming at them all the time on social media and, and, and in magazines and things like that. Yeah, I think the other day I counted um, 35 different company manufacturers or projects of, um, of uh, robotics for agriculture. So that's definitely something happen here, happening here. And we are not the only ones in, in, in this industry. And I think that's a good sign um, that is now things are starting to happen. It's really super interesting to be a part of. Um, but the good question is why, why now? Um, I think we see uh, some things on the consuming side, but also on the farming side, um, there are trends and, and challenges uh, there, but maybe you could dive into to that later, you asked me what is special about Roboti. Um, in fact, I find it a bit counterintuitive because what makes us unique among um, many of our colleagues in this industry is in fact that we are quite standard in many ways. So our robot is a diesel hydraulic system. We have, we, it comes with PTO um, and hydraulic outlets. It has a completely standard three point hitch so, and, and it navigates with the uh, auto steering. So it's all these elements you, you already know from a tractor setup. Uh, so one could argue it's like a mini tractor um, Roboti. And um, honestly, that is what makes us unique that we are in so many ways, very standard. Um, and the feedback from the market, I believe is, is good um, because these are technologies or solutions that the user, the farmer can already relate to. Um, if we focus on the mechanical side, uh, it's a completely standard Kubota diesel engine um, in, in the robot. It's super easy to service. It's easy to get spare parts to. So it, it's not something that's gonna scare a farmer in, 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 in um, Brazil or in Spain or where, wherever you are, because it's, it's an, an intuitive system. Um, it's easy to, to get around. And then we have the three-point hitch, as mentioned before, uh, which allows us to carry standard uh, basic implements, which are already available on the market today, which the farmer can buy. And furthermore, and uh, more importantly, it allows the farmer to, to use the robot throughout the season for, for different tasks in the field from, from seedbed cultivation to seeding mechanical weeding or even spraying. So we can do many different kinds of, of tasks in the field. And that's definitely also something that makes us unique in, in the market that we do not uh, require any special constructed um, implements uh, in order to have the uh, robot working because it is only the platform, the robot, uh, you need to mount uh, and implement on it before, yeah. Uh, having it working in the in the field, I think I think that's really interesting, and it, it's really important because um, something that you and I have discussed before, and and I've talked to with other manufacturers is adoption um, adoption of these products. So to have something that is 
made, I mean, you know, Roboti, we couldn't describe it as familiar to farmers. You know, it is different to having a tractor, but, yeah. you know, it uses a guidance system in the way that a tractor uses a guidance system. So if someone has got a modern day tractor with auto steering on it, they won't feel uncomfortable using the, the setup on robotic. Um, it's got diesel engines and, and if there's one thing farmers do know that it's diesel engines and they understand the hydraulics and everything else with it, which is great. PTOs, three point hitches, fantastic. But more importantly, you know, they can use the equipment, well, to some extent, they can use the equipment that they already have um, with it. And, and in the marketplace, it strikes me, and I, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, but um, that it is the most tractor-like robot out there. You know, it, it, it's, it's a robot that it is a robotic tractor as opposed to a robotic implement, which an awful lot of these other systems are, you know. Um, there are lots of robots out there that will do autonomous weeding, but that's all they will do. Um, and I think that if you want widespread adoption of these things, it needs to be more versatile, such, such as Roboti is. But when we, when we talk about adoption, you know, um, it, you guys have been at this, as you say, properly since 2019. You've, you've been commercially available for a while now. Um, so... What, and I know you've sold some, so please do tell us how many you've sold and who you sold them to, but um, how, what are the challenges you've come across when, when try, with, with adoption and trying to get people to, to take up the offering that is Roboti? Yeah. Um, so first of all, we have sold and delivered uh, 13 uh, of the Roboti 150D, which we call uh, our commercial ready robot. Um, and it's primarily to, to research institutes, um, but we also have uh, some robots working on, on farming side. Um, so we have quite a few in, in Denmark um, where we are working at uh, something called Nordic Beet Research, which uh, yeah, is sugar beets, where we do um, seed bed cultivation, seeding and uh, mechanical weeding, and then band spring there as well in the sugar beets and then we also run Roboti as a service in, in Denmark where we rent our robot out to farmers um, then we are active in, in Czech Republic uh, also more on a contracting basis where our partner there um, also rents uh, the robot out to, to farmers um, mostly operating in, in row crops um, yeah, rapeseed as an example, uh, sugar beets as well. Um, then we have one at a research institute in, in Germany where they're going to uh, use the robot in, in strip farming research. And we also have one in Switzerland at the future farm there. And together with our partner, uh, where the robot is going to be involved in, um, yeah, during the whole season. Um, we have one in Belgium at the Ghent University and then the Netherlands, which is our biggest market right now where we have uh, three robots. Um, they are gonna work, the two of them are gonna work for a contractor there called Smart Agri Technology. Um, and then we have one at Bargaining University. So in total around 30, um, fifth, no, sorry, um, 13 uh, robots. And then we currently have one uh, tin in, in production, including one for, for UK. Um, some of the boundaries, I guess, we experience with this because there is, there's a lot of us uh, people, farmers are interested in, in this and they are enthusiastic about, about Roboti and all the um, technologies and yeah, the setup that you know, surrounds Roboti. Um, but what are the boundaries for, for them to, to dive into this? Of course, it's, you know, it's, it's always a, a risk in taking the perception of a, an ordinary farmer. It's always an, an, a risk to invest in something new. It requires you to, to study it carefully and maybe also to think differently on how you want to plan your fields and work your fields. Um, and I think that, you know, that might be scary to, to some, 
and uh, prevent them for for um, investing in this. Others are a bit more reluctant, conservative. They want to see the robot operating at at the neighbors first before investing themselves. I guess it's that is um, the excuse I hear the most often. Um, yeah, I, I I think what what many of our um, uh, potential customers are missing out there is actually to see the robot operating real life out in the field, um, see that it solves uh, and and see that it solves uh, the 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 tasks well and it works well. And uh, that is what everyone needs to see and what we are trying to show them. I think also it's quite similar to what you saw with auto steering when it that was first introduced in in early 2000 where you at least here in Denmark saw maybe the first year uh, five systems being sold and then the following years it's, it's just um, yeah ex uh, expanded very much uh, I hope of course that it's going to be like like that as well for for Roboti. Yeah although I hope it's quicker you know I, I think we're, we're only just getting to the point now where um, well I think over the last couple of years we've got to the point where auto steering is is a mindset that everyone assumes that they need or what largely assumes that they need depending on their circumstances. Um, but I think I think you're absolutely right. I think there will be a nervousness around this type of equipment. Um, you know, the, it, whilst it's not as expensive as, as buying a, a very large tractor, at the same time, it's still a lot of money um, and people still need to have a tractor. And so, you know, there, there's always going to be a question over that investment and, and the fear of it, um, which I, I can totally understand. And then I guess the other side of it is, is, you know, it brings us back to how easy it is to work with um, uh, and how simple a, a system setup it is. Because, you know, right now, if you're out in a field, tractor breaks down, your tractor dealer isn't far away, um, you know, you can get it a, a replacement tractor, you can get your tractor fixed and, and your, your local dealer looks after you because, you know, if mm. no other reason they want to sell you another tractor in the future. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, I think that's going to be a, a, a big issue around these things. Now, I know, uh, for instance, that we've got a new company in the UK, so Autonomous Agri Solutions, and they're going to be your dealer. And so they'll, they'll be the people providing that sort of support. And, and I'm sure they'll have lots of fantastic ways of dealing with that. Exactly. That's, uh, um, that's usually what we prefer when entering new markets is that we find um, someone locally that can, you know, help, help us breaking these boundaries down. Um, also providing the service and the access to spare parts and so on. So when, when Roboti is out seeding or, and if something breaks down, then we can be there on the spot uh, within uh, a short um, time and, and get the problem solved so the farmer can carry on. Uh, of course, that is super, super important uh, to have that infrastructure to support um, yeah, Roboti working. And that is, um, of course, always a bit tricky to, to set up when, when you want to enter a new market but it's definitely something we are focusing on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, you know, it's a key to adoption is, is having someone locally that you can phone and say, my robot's broken. That sounds like a strange thing to say, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm sure it's what we'll be saying uh, in, in the not too distant future. And I, I guess a lot of this comes back to, and sort of correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the theory is that, you know, if you've, if you've got a field that needs drilling with sugar beet, you'll set Roboti up um, and, and maybe in the future you've got two Robotis and you can set Roboti up and, and send it off to drill that field while you go and deal with something else. Um, it's got its maps, it knows what it's doing and everything else. And I think everybody understands that, that that's what you're doing. You're removing a, a person from the labour. But I mean, I, I know that a question I got asked when we had Roboti on the stand at Lama was, you know, what happens if um, the seed drill gets blocked or, um, or something like that? Because obviously right now I'm sitting in a tractor, the, there's a, a blocked coulter on the drill. 
I either realize that because I can see what's going on behind me or I get a, an alarm depending on what drill I've got and, and it tells me and I stop. Um, you know, and I think yeah. people's conception is that robot is just going to carry on going and, and they're going to have a missed row of, of sugar beet for that time. So, you yeah. know, uh, we are working on um, on something similar to to uh, yeah, I suppose um, to communicate with the implement. Uh, the issue from our side is that we only provide the platform, the robot, and there are so many different implements out on the market. Um, and we need to find something that can communicate uh, with the most of them. And that is something we uh, are yeah, looking very much into because of, you don't want that situation where you think uh, Robotia has seeded the whole field and then you find out that it hasn't, you know, that that doesn't work. So um, of course with, uh, we, we are looking into to this as well. Okay, right, fantastic. And so, um, I guess the other thing that we should talk about, I mean, you know, right now you've got, a, you know, you've got your commercial machine, which is the 150D. Yeah. And this is a, uh, a, a machine with 150 horsepower. Um, it's, so it actually runs two Gabota engines. So 75 horsepower each. Um, and that has a PTO as standard. So that's the commercially available machine. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, yeah, I think actually I forgot really to introduce Roboti. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Roboti, you know, you, yeah. there are other versions of Roboti and, and we'll get onto those, but then they're, they're not as or aren't commercially available at the moment. But, um, you know, the 150D, we've got PTO, three point hitch, working width up to three meters. Yeah. So, so you can actually make it 3.6 meters maximum and then you can have uh, three meter plus yeah three point ten or so uh, implements, but the most common I guess would be to have uh, three meter implements mounted, and then the length the working width would be three point five. Um, yeah. Okay. But again, it it depends on the customer. We also have uh, vegetable farmers using uh, robots in in bits, and if their bits are uh, 1.8 or 2 meters, then we can, uh, then we will construct the robot according to, to these uh, measures. So it fits for them, but maximum working width would be up to, yeah, around 3.5 meters. Yeah, okay. And so this comes back to the agro and tele sort of business model, doesn't it? Or the robotic business model in that it's more about you supplying a base machine or, or a customer buying a base machine and, and customizing to their needs. Yeah, um, exactly. Okay. And then in the future, so we, you know, that's the 150D. And then you also have, I'll call it a smaller machine. It's not a smaller machine, but the, the 75, yeah. um, which is just a 75 horsepower machine that won't have a PTO, but, um, you know, for inter-row hoeing, um, that kind of activity where there isn't the mechanical needed, it's much more along the right lines. Yeah, so 150D, two Kubota diesel engines, 75 horsepower each. D stands for dual, dual um, two engines. And of course, if you don't, um, so oh, a short comment, so one engine, um, drives propulsion of the robot, so it makes the robot going forward or backwards. The other one, um, the other Propota engine, uh, operates all the um, external hydraulics and the PTO. Um, and if you have the 150D uh, and you don't need, uh, if you're solving something, driving with an implement where you don't need PTO, for example, or external hydraulics, then you can turn the second engine off, running with only one engine. Um, but you have the option to, to do tasks which require PTO, for example. It's correct that we are also uh, developing a, we call it a 70 version. So 75 horsepower is for single, so a single engine version, um, where the engine only um, provides power for propulsion. And um, this, this version 
uh, we're testing it during spring uh, this year, and then we'll have it market ready um, by the end of this year. Um, it's going to be a more lightweighted uh, robot. It's going to be intended for more like basic tasks. So if you want to operate a mechanical seeder and you want to do only mechanical weeding, for example, very basic task which does not require a lot of power, then this robot, this version would be more suited towards that context. But if you want, if you're looking into seedbed cultivation and if you want to, yeah, if, if, if you require PTO and external hydraulics, then the 150D would probably be the, uh, the right uh, version for in, in that context. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. Um, and so what is the, you know, uh, you've sold 13 at the moment, you're driving forward, you're building another 10. We have, there's yeah. one coming to the UK that's been sold into the Southeast, I think. And uh, obviously we, we've got a dealer being set up in the UK. Um, so where do you, you know, what's the target for, for Roboti? Is it a hundred units a year? Is it a thousand units a year? Is it, what well, you know, is there a short term and a long term? Where, where do you see it going? And and what's the development process on top of that? So are we on Roboti Mark 1? And before we really get going, we'll be on Roboti Mark 2? Or, you know, how, how do you see that moving forward? It's our aim to produce, sell and deliver 50, 15, or oh, 50, sorry, 50 robots uh, this year. Um, and something uh, to work on. <laughs> um, this is not uh, Roboti Mark 1. It's, uh, I think it's more like Roboti Mark uh, 100. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, of course, yeah. <laughs> as I said in, in the beginning, uh, we saw the first early versions um, in early 2000. And since then, we have seen very, very many different versions of, uh, of Roboti. And um, in 2018, 19, we, I think we reached a point where, you know, it, it starts to make sense. Now we can see that the solution we offer is, has potential and can solve uh, some issues out there. And it's, yeah, it's looking more like it. Uh, it's almost two, two meter tall machine. It's um, the biggest machine is five meters wide, um, 2.5 meters in depth. So it's, it's quite large um, and it has been tested and developed for, for 20 years. So um, I think we are, we are going to stick to this concept we have now. Um, so what I'm saying is that it, we are maturing with this and we see great potential in, in, in this design. Yeah, so we're not going to see anything radically change, but you, you know, we'll, we'll, you will see a development of what we've got right now. So that's cool. I, mean, I think actually, I think it's going to stick much like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but you do bring up an you know an interesting um, point. So, like the the biggest machine is is five meters wide and it's two and a half meters deep. So, what's the process um, for you know for for a farmer who's got to move this? Uh, you know, he's got to, he's got one field here and then he's got to move to the next field, which is maybe two miles away. Um, which happens plenty. Um, you know, what um, is it easy to move around? Have we, you know, we suddenly got to buy specialist equipment to move it around? What, what, what? How does that work for, for the farm? If um, if I'm very visionary um, about future farming, I imagine that the farmer in the morning, um, you know, mount three or five robots on a flatbed, a trailer, or something. And then drives out to to the fields and install robot number one. Press start, go off to the next field. Press uh, press start and go, and then drives back home or somewhere else and and remotely monitor the robot. Um, I think you know that would be the the great future. Um, in terms of transporting the uh, the robot around, so you can operate it manually around if it's fields nearby. But for longer distances, we uh, are suggesting, I don't know if you know them, um, but these like flat bedded trailers where you can lower the bed, uh, the, the trailer to, to, the, um, to the ground, and then you only need small ramps and then you can 
uh, drive the robot up there manually and then you will attach the trailer to a tractor or something and then drive to the field and uh, yeah, take the robot off and put it on the field and off it goes. And so, so what's the um, what's the weight of robotic? I, I guess in its biggest form, how how heavy is it? Um, yeah, it's in its heaviest form. It's about three tons. Okay, okay. So, so yeah. it's going to be um, it's going it's going to be quite lighter. Yeah. So um, you yeah you don't necessarily have to have a tractor to turn it around. Is is what I'm thinking. Um, but Okay, so okay, so we've we've talked about how conventional the system is um, and how easy it will be for people to understand because they will recognise the systems uh, and the operation of of Roboti from uh, a conventional tractor. So, talk us through uh, a day with Roboti or, or getting started with Roboti and, and and how we get it into the field. And uh, and a question that will definitely come up with with our customers is getting our maps that we already have of our fields in, in, into Roboti. Yeah, um, and this is also where it, uh, it gets a bit uncommon for, for the ordinary farmer, I guess. But um, before taking the robot to the field, it actually starts in front of the computer. You have to make a plan that the robot uh, can uh, operate according to in the field. Um, and making a plan is something that you do on, on our homepage uh, where, the, uh, where the user receives a login to, and then it's following four steps. So first you have to upload um, the boundaries of the field and um, you, do this, you do this with um, RTK GPS and you generate a shape file, which I believe you know much more about than I do. <laughs> yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah. So you, you mark the boundaries, you mark any obstacles on the field, if there are any windmills or anything, you, you trees or whatever, you will, you'll mark that on the, um, in this shape file and then uh, you'll upload it to our system and then you have the boundaries defined. The next step is to define what kind of uh, implement you are driving with, and what kind of task you're solving. So is it, a, is it a seeding task or it's a drilling or what are you doing? Um, so you, you need to inform about the implement, how wide it is and what the offset is and such things. The third step is to define how you want to operate uh, or navigate in, in the headlands. So do you want to work the headlands at all? And if you do, how do you want to turn in them and so on? Um, how do you want the robot to, to drive? Should it take one row at the time? Um, or can it do allow it to, to operate more optimized? So it might skip one and come back to it later in order to finish a bit faster. Uh, those are the kind of considerations you will take into account there. Then the fourth step, fourth step, final step is to define how the robot should approach the rows um, in the field. Um, and then after this, you, um, you, have, you have your plan and it's uploaded to the, to the cloud. And now you can take the, um, the robot to the field and access uh, that plan you, you made um, prior this uh, on your computer. And then you simply press uh, start and go. And then meanwhile, the robot is operating. You um, can live monitor um, the robot. We have cameras on it. So uh, live streaming what's in front of the robot and live streaming down on the implement so you can actually see if how the uh, implement is working in, in the soil. Um, if you see something you don't like, you can stop the robot remotely and you can you know, go to the robot and fix the issue and then resume. Um, you can also see when the robot expects to be finished. And yeah, in general, you, you can access a lot of different in, information here while it's operating. Uh, you'll also get your your dashboard, which you know from a, a tractor dashboard, where you can see like oil pressure and fuel level and everything. Um, so, yeah, you it will keep you updated. Uh, when when the robot is then finished, um, it drives to the edge of the field uh, on a mark you have defined in in this plan, and then it shuts off and and it forwards you a text message saying. Uh, 
I'm Robati, I'm now done with this task. It took me so long and so on, and I'm ready for pickup. Um, yeah, and then that, that is the process, that is how it works. I can imagine plenty of people personalizing that text message, so it doesn't say I'm Robotti, but they'll be calling them Frank and Fred and things like that. But, um, so, I mean, having the dashboard and understanding what's going on, it, you know, raises another question. So, the, the, well, two questions for me, actually, which I think is, is now becomes an interesting comparison with a, with a conventional tractor. So, how many hectares a day are we going to get out of a robotic yeah uh, and which leads me on to the next question which is a, a trade-off of this is is how much fuel does it use what's you know what's the diesel the liters per hour usage of, of a robotic in in a typical application i mean we've been talking a lot about sugar beet so let's say in drilling sugar beet yeah um so fuel consumption very much depend on soil and what you're doing and are you running with the pto and everything and, but usually we see somewhere between f three to six uh, liters per hectare okay in consumption in terms of how um, the hectare capacity of course it depends on on the shape of the um the field and how fast you're going but if we assume um that you operate five kilometers uh, power, then you will be able to cover uh, 1.25 hectares um, or 3.1 acres uh, in one hour. If we can also operate up to eight kilometers power or five miles, then it's two hectares power or almost five acres. Yeah. Uh, um, but I should say that if you choose to operate eight kilometers power. Um, we have not really tested very much how that influenced the, for example, the precision of when you seed or if you do mechanical weeding or drilling, um, that might influence the uh, precision slightly. Um, so, but I guess when, when you are, when you're seeding normally, then you typically, typically go around five kilometers power. And then we, we have a capacity of yeah, 1.25 hectares or 3.1 acres. Yeah, because I, I mean, this is this is the trade-off that I think, uh, and it brings us back to the, the adoption thing that I think a lot of people struggle with, because, you know, um, and and I know when people are talking to me about robotics, they're like, but it's, it's just so slow, or it's just this. And you go, well, yeah, it is. But I mean, when you talk about mechanical weeding, there aren't, you know, most people in a tractor are going to be going uh, at slow speeds anyway. So I think that's absolutely fine that, you know, talking about five kilometers an hour, um, I don't think you'd be going, uh, you know, I don't think there's a need to go up to eight kilometers an hour. I think when people talk about speed, if you're drilling wheat, yeah, okay. So from comparing it to a conventional tractor point of view, it is slower. Um, but you haven't got a man on a seat, he can be off doing something else, something more productive maybe, or, or generating other income um, whilst robotic is doing its job. And I think this is, this is kind of the area where people start to struggle and, and, and start to not understand. But then when you start to talk about, well, if we're doing a hectare, uh, 1.5 hectares an hour, and we're only using between three and six liters of diesel, well, we actually got a, a big saving in fuel coming this way as well. So there's lots of, um, you know, there's lots of trade-offs in the conversation and the understanding uh, of using a, a vehicle like this, isn't there? This is really a good point. It's so, um, it, it's much more detailed uh, and colored than only a, a hectares power. If, it, it really also requires something of the uh, of the farm management. Um, if we assume that we have 21 days, three weeks to seed in, that's the short window of seeding um, where the weather and all conditions are good. And if, if you drive five kilometers power and eight, 18 um, hours per day, and then you will in this period reach almost 500 hectares um which you can then if you if you do that and you're going to do mechanical weeding or hilling or a little of spain spring maybe four four times uh, over the season 
in these almost 500 hectares, um, then you will get up to almost 2,000 hectares with the robot. And this is this is what we need to do. You need to be creative or not creative. You need to um, be very clear in your farm management and, and plan how you want to to use uh, Roboti. Uh, the key is to get sufficient number of hours on it. When you get that, then the investment pays off. You want to use it in early spring seeding uh, and then follow up with the uh, four, maybe five, six times of uh, some kind of uh, mechanical weeding or anything. And then you want to, to use it in, in the fall for cover crop seeding. And again, with you should do the, uh, the weeding with the robot. Then it really starts to make sense. And that's only when you look on the, uh, if, if you want to talk about capacity there. So it's so much more detailed than this, I think personally. Um, there are other arguments we could tap into, for example, reducing the risk of soil compaction or the possibility of, of earlier seeding. You know, that, that's also two factors that can increase yields. Um, in Denmark, for example, we have usually very wet uh, winters. So oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're brothers on that one. Yeah, we're in the same boat. And for example, in sugar beets, it's, it's crucial, um, or there's a, a direct link with the earlier you seed, the higher the yields that you are, and our more lightweight solution allows for that earlier seeding. So there's also a, a small advantage there to, um, to gain, I think. Then if you do seeding with Roboti, you also have the opportunity to to do the first uh, mechanical weeding blind. Uh, so doing mechanical weeding just after seeding, you know, that has research shows uh, that that also uh, indicates higher yields. You can maybe optimize this whole um, weeding um, throughout the season. So you manage to weed more frequent and often. And again, that's really good when we are, when we are focusing on, on higher yields. And then one thing I think that makes really good sense, for example, in, in, in vegetables, in a vegetable context where you have bed systems, you don't grow, grow the um, headlands of the fields. Um, so the robot can turn around it own, in its own X. So it can turn in, in five meters. Um, what if, the, uh, if your headland is only five or six meters uh, narrow, then maybe you can have slightly longer beds which again, if, if you can have one, two meter longer bits, that is also high yields per hectare. And, you know, it's, it's, this is the way I think you need to, to think of, of, a, of going autonomous, really. Yeah, I mean, it's the versatility it brings you, I think. And, uh, you know, it, this comes up all the time with ag, ag tech, and, and we talk about it at RTKFnet as well, is that, you know, these things are, a lot of the time they're about a change in mindset and a change the way you think about how you operate your farm and um, uh, and adopting or adapting to what new technology can give us. And if new technology gives us, um, it, you know, it, it's four meters, isn't it? If it instead of, if, if we get a bed that's at one, two, one or two meters longer at one end, we also get that at the other end. So, you know, we're, we're, we're getting, a lot more out of it or uh, especially across a bigger field it's uh, adjusting to all these small details you can in order to make the big impact yeah um, it's, it's maximizing the efficiencies that uh, autonomous equipment offers you um, and but as we're talking not, about those 18 hours a day um, yeah. you know it can go out and it can do it a hundred percent capacity a hundred percent of the time because it's a robot um, and, and, you know, plenty of us have gone out and worked in tractors and we've been, you know, in there for 18, 20, 22 hours a day in, in certain times of the year, I'm sure. Um, and, you, you know, I, we all hear the stories from, from our counterparts in the industry. Um, but if we're honest with ourselves, we're not working at our best of our ability the whole time um, it, during those periods, whereas robotic will be. Yeah, um, actually, we have a video on, on YouTube. You are welcome to link to um, from uh, from Czech Republic last year. Where we did a thirty hectares field in twenty four hours, where the robot operating nonstop, only stopping for for uh, refueling uh, seeds and fuel. 
uh, but we did uh, 30 hectares in 24 hours, um, which I think was, uh, yeah, uh, very good. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Man, but again, it just brings you back to that, that thing, doesn't it? Because you, if you talk to a, a farmer today and say, oh, we did 30 hectares in 24 hours, their immediate reaction is, well, I, I can do so much more than that. And you go, well, you can do so much more than that, but you can't do anything else while you're doing it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and I, I think that's the key point. Well, I think, um, I think it's really interesting. I think... Um, at some point this year, and, and I think it really depends on, on the pandemic and, and how that's all going to be working, but there is going to be a, a demonstration of Roboti in the UK. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, when we hear from you, we'll make sure that we let as many people know as well. And, um, and no doubt we'll be there to have a look and, and see how we can get involved. But, the um, you know, it's been really, really great to talk to you about robotics, to talk to you about robotics and to talk to you about the adoption processes behind robotics um, and what we can do going forward with all these things. Because I think everyone knows that this is coming. Um, and uh, I think that it's the people who are, you know, adopt it and look at it quickly will, will be the real winners in, in this marketplace. Um, but as you say, you know, lots of people want to see it working. They want to see their neighbours using it. And, and we have to, you know, um, see how all of that goes. But so thank you very much, Frederick, for coming along and, and having a chat with us and telling us all about it. There will be links below to Agro and Tele um, and uh, to some videos and things so you can see. And um, if you've got any questions for Frederick or myself, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. Yeah, perfect. And thanks uh, so much for the invite to this. It was a super great and interesting uh, conversation, I think. And yeah, follow us on uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn. We will uh, we will um, yeah communicate when we are coming over as soon as the situation is allowing it. And yeah, really looking forward to to seeing Roboti in in England. <laughs> yeah, well, so are we absolutely. But for the second time, we've had it over once, but just on, on a standard. In the fields of England. <laughs> yeah, in the field, in the field. That's what we want to see. So, great. All right.